<laughs> hey, everybody. Hi, guys. Well, from London in one part of the world and Salt Lake City in another part of the world, it's Thank God I'm Atheist, the podcast. I'm Frank. And I'm Dan. Coming up on today's episode, Dan uh, talks to the third highest ranking official in the Church of England. Well done, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. It was a good get. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, I can't wait to hear all the the, you know, the whole story behind that. That's, that's pretty awesome. All the juicy details. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, so yeah, so we've got that coming up. We have all of our normal stuff. We're going to hear a fun little audio clip. Well, it's actually not so much fun. It's just good it's just nice just good <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> yeah, that's a nice what's yeah. wrong with nice in the world there's nothing wrong with nice in the world i don't think that hurts um, anybody yeah so uh so you you have something kind of kind of fascinating dan i do i'm i'm i it's um so you remember we've mentioned him a couple times on this little podcast of ours one mr alain de Breton. yeah yeah that guy I just like saying it. Yeah, I, I, I've I've settled in on calling him Alan de Baden, though because it it's easier <laughs> for me to remember from yes, day to day. Okay. So, <laughs> so anyway, there there we are. Mister de Baden uh-huh. uh, has has branched out just a little bit from his uh, from his previous ventures as a as as a an atheist who advocates uh, I don't know I guess religious practice in an atheist environment or whatever. He's now advocating more something or less. new. Yeah, okay. Yeah, more or less, whatever. So the new thing that he, he's starting <laughs> is uh, porn. <laughs> porn? He's porn. going for porn. <laughs> okay. He wants to do a... He's, 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 uh, he's released, done a press release where he uh, he's decided that he wants to uh, create porn... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that could be harnessed uh, to what is noblest in us. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, no longer would sexuality have to be lumped together with stupidity, brutishness. Oh, I'm sorry. This needs to be done in a British accent. And since I'm here, I might as well do it. And he does speak with a British accent. Uh-huh. So, you know. Yeah. No longer would sexuality have to be lumped together with stupidity, brutishness earnestness and exploitation he wrote uh, it could instead be harnessed to what is noblest in us showing kindness or working hard or being clever <laughs> working hard or being clever <laughs> those, that, those are noble pursuits i don't i don't just like just like porn <laughs> <laughs> what kind of porn would this be a uh, better porn <laughs> Is what he's is what he's calling it now. Well, at least now we have a little uh, insight as to what gets uh, Mister Debaden off. Yeah, um, right. Well, porn does just being like the clever. Rest of us. He just wants a clever woman. That's all. Right. <laughs> or man. Or man. I don't know we don't anything know about his him. sexuality. But yeah, he's, a, he's <clears throat> a sexual desire would be invited to support rather than permitted to undermine our higher values. <laughs> Wow, all right, cool. Hey, you know what? I support it. I'll totally check out his porn site. It may not be very hot, though. It may not be yeah, very erotic. One, huh? one does wonder about that. The picture that Huffington Post did for this thing, which I don't think has anything to do with his actual... Right, no, they, mis- they'll they post anything to go with it. Yeah. Is actually a picture of... um, What's his name? Uh... Uh, Peter Blake, Sir Peter Blake, um, who's who's a a uh, a British artist, pop artist, and he, he looks he looks kind of like Freud. He's he's an old guy with a white beard and white hair and bald on top. Okay, Sin- play, playing chess up across the <laughs> across the chessboard from a naked lady. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, smart. So there you go. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, um, smart, uh, smart porn. I, I'm into it. Speaking of um, um, porn, I guess. Yeah. I don't know how this. This is. Uh, have you? Have you? Did Dan? Did you hear about this whole thing? Um, the Mormons. They, they've been doing some photoshopping. I posted a photoshopped thing on on the Facebook page. 
that they right. did. Yeah, you did. Well, apparently that's Anyone, not... Any one of the people out there who hasn't seen that is clearly missing out and needs to like us on the Facebook. Yeah, and then you can you can follow us and everything. Um, that's yeah. facebook.com slash TGI Atheist. Um, but um, no, the um, so I posted that one, and that one's, that one's funny, and it's kind of sad because it's, you know, these... Um, <clears throat> African women who are um, standing around and they're all holding pictures of Jesus, the, the very Mormon Jesus portrait. Right. And yeah. uh, white, white Jesus, white Jesus. Very w- and they're Jesus. all smiling. They're all kind of laughing. They're all see, they all seem oh, to be very happy about the picture. Time. Yeah. They are. They are thrilled. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, and then, oh, oops, they weren't really holding pictures of Christ. They, there was an original photo and, <laughs> Anyways, so <laughs> they the, just photoshopped in Jesus. They photoshopped in Jesus because that's what they that's what they needed for. Right. Th- this was in their uh, their monthly publication, their their magazine <laughs> called the Enzyme, and uh, it's just fantastic. Okay, you don't have the photo? Well, Photoshop it. That's what Photoshop's for. Well, right. um, they also have they they've done it again. Um, this that was not an isolated event. They um they've been altering images of um Carl Heinrich Bloch or Bloch Bloch I don't Who's know that he is a uh, he was a 19th century Danish artist and he did sort of the classic Jesus that um sort of the older Jesus portrait that the that the Mormons used to really love so much ah. right you probably remember that one. Um, yeah. but anyways, he did a, he did a whole bunch of Jesus images and, you know, they, they show up everywhere. Um, they yeah. show up in meeting houses in members homes, um, and apparently he, official he, publications. He wasn't a Mormon. No, 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 he wasn't. Um, wait, what, what, but anyways, what era was he? Do what? What era was he? Uh, 19th century. Um, oh, okay. the, the painting in question that, that, that they've altered that this woman um she has a blog um uh, doves and serpents is the (laughs) name of the blog um anyways she she kind of spotted it and she posted it and she's she's mormon and she just just she's kind of outraged at sort of the the um obsessed nature that that that, that, the hierarchy of the church has, has started to place on um on, on just sort of the idea of modesty, right? And so oh, um, they took one of his yeah. paintings, and let me actually see if I can. Um, I'm going to hold this up to the to the camera, Dan, so you can you can get a okay. sense of like what what the thing is. Um, oh yes, please. So here's the original, and you'll notice that the angels in this one have uh, they have wings, right? Which is sort of oh uh, oh boy. Let me let me see. Is that, can oh, you see it? Yeah. That's nice, right? Oh, that's very lovely. You got yeah. Jesus sort of in his, in the, the Y position from YMCA. <laughs> and you got, yeah. you got the two lovely angels kneeling uh-huh. at his feet, ready, ready to do the other letters. Yeah, when exactly. When the time comes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, but they, really they nice. have wings, which Mormons don't, uh-huh. uh, Mormons don't believe that angels have wings. Um, right. And um, I want you to notice how immodest these 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 angels are can you see that um Dan? I de- move it just a little to the right my right uh yeah right there okay oh well my goodness her her arm is completely bare <laughs> that's her yeah. arm so I can see her shoulder for crying out loud so um this is the uh modified version of the painting and it, this appeared in the enzyme <laughs> Uh, the wing, the wings are gone, and uh, you'll notice that that the that their arms are that they've done sleeve caps. For right, the arms. they are they are now they now the angels could be wearing garments. <laughs> and we exactly, would... <laughs> exactly. They are temple garment um, modest. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, the word modesty here isn't about. Um, Anything other than, I guess, just not showing too much of your body. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's Mormon the, Mormon use of the word modesty is very specific. Yeah. Oh yeah. In that. Um, but there's some stuff that you probably didn't see in there. Um, in the original image, um, there you could kind of see 
like the 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 gar the the the, the top that they're wearing is sort of very loose fitting yeah. and you can kind of see yeah. Some un- some exposed skin under the arm and kind of the back a little bit, right? Well, ooh, in the new ooh, one, they, it's bad. it's basically like they had them just put a t-shirt on underneath the the, <laughs> the top, <laughs> which is kind of a standard Mormon practice. If 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 a if a woman likes a dress but it's just not very <laughs> modest, she'll wear a little t-shirt underneath it, right? So that it right it, even if even if it has modest. spaghetti straps on it. Even if the dress is a tank top with spaghetti straps or something like that, that's uh, she'll put a t-shirt on under it. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. A very attractive look. And what I love though is that this blogger, I just I love this woman because she's she's just kind of so willing to call out um, the church on this. Um, she 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 wonders um, why didn't they cover up the resurrected Jesus's nipple? <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point. That's so awesome. it obviously it has to do with female modesty and not so much male modesty because yep there it is there's a there's a nipple there's a, you a know Jesus what we should nip. do okay so Frank I'm gonna ask you to post these pictures on the Facebook oh yeah sure and if any of our uh, enterprising listeners feel a compunction to do so <laughs> I invite you to download it and Photoshop some garments onto Jesus yeah that's a great idea. Or just I cover up that, that nipple, a little pasty, a little or pasty. Just, yeah, would you, put, you know? put him in something a little more modest? Let's modest <laughs> Jesus up, because frankly, this nobody is get, likes it's getting out of control. Jesus. Nobody likes Jesus needs, Jesus. Jesus needs to get his shit together. Yeah, he's kind of all that. over the place. Well, and, you're at it. Put some shoes on the guy. Yeah. Uh, anyway. He's, yeah, well, there you I go. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what can he do? Should we get a little more serious? Sure. Uh, Get serious, Frank. Okay. Let's be let's be let's be newsy. So here's what I found on uh on CNN.com. Okay. The, the Catholic Archdiocese of, of Washington. That's Washington DC. Okay. The capital of your country. Okay. My country too when I return. Yes. Uh, the Catholic Archdiocese has apparently just reamed Georgetown University, which is a Catholic university, the oldest Catholic re- university in the country, it just ripped them a new one because they invited a Catholic to speak at one of their events. Oh, what? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> no. What kind uh, of Catholic? Until until you find out that that Was Catholic it? is one Miss Kathleen Sebelius, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services. Mm, okay. Um. Apparently they were. I mean, they were literally. They're having her do the the speech for uh, the their the university's public policy institute, um, and uh, she, yeah, they're really upset, and and the whole thing is about President Obama's mandate that uh, everybody has to provide uh, insurance with. That that everybody's insurance has to have, um, oh, what's it? Birth control, right? So she, they're just furious. Even though he's made the con- he's made concessions so that like religions themselves, ministries specifically, ministries don't have to. They're still furious about it because because their schools don't count as ministries and all of these other things. They mm. said, you know, something along the lines of the. She defined ministry so narrowly that only, essentially, they basically said that only ministries can can get the exemption. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's that's funny. It's ridiculous, I but like they're that. they're outraged. Oh no! Because why would a university want the Secretary of Health and Human Services to come and speak? Yeah, are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, that kind of sucks. Ridiculous. I had uh, at my commencement, I had a. Uh, well, what was the dude's name? Um, he was in Bush's administration. He was like, oh, who was he? Crap. I shouldn't have gone down that path. What was his <laughs> name? But anyways, it was like this high ranking. Uh, uh, I can't come up with his name. I can see his face because he's at the commencement and he's speaking. And like the year prior, it would have been like Terry Tempest Williams, which most right. people outside of Utah won't know who she is, but she's this sort of you know environmentalist poet 
author, right. writer, left leaning, olding, and, aging and, hippie type, right? Um, right. And then they get this like the next year, it's dude, and I was just like, meh. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, whatever. <laughs> Commencement. I just think I just think you know what? Uh, you, no university should turn down the opportunity to have a high ranking. Like a secretary level yeah. official, come and talk to them. Like this is this is a get. This is a big deal. <laughs> and, and the Catholic Church is like, ah, man, screw that lady. <laughs> She's she likes she wants women to have choices. No, Burr. that's Burr. wrong. Well, hey Dan, do you find it hard to yeah. talk to people? Well, no. Do you do you find it hard to talk to Mormons? Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, apparently evangelicals have a hard time talking to Mormons. Um, there's oh, a bet. there's a new guide out um, that's just been published um, yeah. called uh, "Talking with Mormons: An Invitation to Evangelicals." <laughs> um, it's by one Mr. I think Richard J. Tells Mao. Me they're not inviting Mormons to dinner, or or inviting Mormons to parties. What's this invitation? I'm playing off of the invitation thing. Well, talking look, to them. You look so confused. It's about talking yeah. to them. You're supposed yeah, to. Okay. He, he's inviting you to talk to them. Yeah. Well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, um, he says uh, we've often seriously misrepresented the beliefs and practices of members of the LDS faith, meaning we evangelicals. Um, it's a terrible mm. thing to bear false witness. Okay. Oh, uh, and he said yeah. this um, at the Mormon Tabernacle in November 2004. Um, and for the last so uh, so many years, he has been working on trying to figure out how to get his fellow evangelicals to appreciate sort of the conversations that they could have with Mormons, but also um, appreciating the fact that and this is where he gets very non-evangelical <laughs> about it um <laughs> he, he wants them to um um wh where was it oh we must thrust up r against religious traditions not our own um to find peace with the world this is actually somebody else speaking um but mm. she's speaking about i'm sorry he's speaking about this guy um, okay. uh, we try to find some common, uh, meeting ground where we can understand one another. Right. And this idea yeah. that, that, that looking at Joseph Smith and saying, you know, oh, you know, like here, here was how God dealt with this man at this time. Right. It's a little too ecumenical <laughs> for evangelicals. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, so it's really, um, kind of bizarre um, because he's, he's really trying to, to get his people to, um, to kind of appreciate Mormon theology. But what's really interesting in this article, really? it's by, it's by Peggy Fletcher Stack, um, who we've talked about before. She writes for the Salt Lake Tribune. She's a religion writer. Right. Um, and this is, this is not a quote. This is just her writing here it says, too often, evangelicals pick up little taught LDS beliefs, such as humans becoming gods or having their own planets, and put them at the at the center of Mormon theology rather than at the periphery. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, Miss uh, Peggy Fletcher Stack, um, I don't know. I grew up in this faith, and I want to say that those things are pretty central. Well, and even if they're not like frequently taught or even if they're, you know, not focused on in church, they're still there. They're still doctrinal, I wanna which means that you can make them as central as you want to make them. Well, and I want to say that they are taught very centrally. I mean, I remember the first lessons that uh, that I remember learning about the plan of salvation, right? When I was in, right. in, 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 in primary, as a, just a little kid, I remember like making this little, little cut out paper flow chart thing so that I could, I could. <laughs> understand the the you know the pre-existence and then life on earth and then judgment and and then you know where we're going to go and part of that discussion always is celestial kingdom and that's where you can yeah. become a god and make your own planets right right and that's always part yeah. of that discussion that always 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 is so i mean how can you say that a that a religion's 
conception of what happens to you after death is not central. Right. You know, and so it's I mean, one of the points of religion. Yeah. I mean, this is like, this is like really, 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 um, apologetic stuff of Mormonism. <laughs> and I think Peggy <laughs> Fletcher Stack should be called on it. I think we should, I think you or, or I should send her a little, a little message. A little because, something, something. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I, I think that, I think this is, I think that's kind of a big deal. And I, I don't think that yeah. it should be downplayed. Um, I think it's wrong to downplay, um, and, and to say that, oh, well, no, the really central things about Mormonism are that, you know, it's a Christian faith and that, you know, that they, that they preach having a personal relationship with God and blah, 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 right. blah, which is what they, which is what the, the main sort of marketing message of the church has been lately. Right. You know, well, oh, but of course that that's, that's their, that's going to be their line as they go out into the world and try and normalize Mormonism so that they can get a Mormon president in, uh -huh. they're going to, they're, we're going to try and make this as normal as you can possibly be. But yeah, but when it comes, is, when, yeah, these are, these are your beliefs. Yeah. These this are is core. every bit as, as, as meaningful a belief as, as any of the other ones. But you cannot separate the plan of salvation, which for our, maybe our, our listeners who don't have, um, a very, 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 are terribly versed in Mormonism. Plan of salvation is, is what the Mormons call sort of the, the path that we follow through, um, pre-existence to earth life to afterlife. It's the, it's the whole thing. It goes from creation right. all the way through, uh, the, the, the second coming of Christ basically. Right. And all of that factors in and fits in, has a place in this plan. Um, yes. and, and it was it's presented to plan. us. It was, a, it's, you know, Two thirds of the host of heaven recognized that it was a very good plan. <laughs> so, I uh, you know that, two, that that two, wins. Two out of three hosts of heaven agree. It's a good plan. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, if you do it right, you end up with your own planet, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're a god. You get to be you get to be god of your own planet. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? Yeah. I mean, I kind of don't. I don't either. Seems like a hassle. Do you have to put like people on your planet? Can I just, <laughs> can I just get a planet and just chill there? Just make weird looking animals. Giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. Well, that's probably that's just, all God was up to on this planet until he decided to get to work. You know, with the yeah. dinosaurs and everything. He was just having fun. I, I just. I think I would do it differently than than Mormon God. I think I would I would I would live on the planet with the people I create and just chill, just hang out. Yeah, just have a good time. Wow, look at you! I think that'd be more fun than hanging out in heaven. Do you get to create your own plan for each planet? I figure if I'm God, I got to do whatever the fuck I want. Hmm. Don't, I don't you? Know. I don't know. I don't know how that works. We have to we have to obey our our God's rules for us. I'm pretty when sure we do our own planet. It's the way that it's done, Same. Dan. It's the way that it's done. That's the way that Boo. that's how the universe works. That's you tell Yahweh I'm an innovator. I can't be tied down like that. <laughs> tell Elohim. Okay. All right. Get on it. All right. So uh, I don't want to go back to politics right now. That's All right. What we I'm, gonna, have. I'm gonna do something. I'm going to do something sad. <gasps> oh. Yeah. Dan, why? Because, be, well, because it brings up a really important point, a really important question. Okay. Let's hear it. I read, I read an article um, about two people out of Portland, Oregon. One Mr. Uh, Terry Daniel Sr. and Lisa Haynes. Okay. Who, uh, who, um, 60, 60 years old and 55, respectively who were living in Portland and they were having a lot of trouble. Um, Haynes, she had epilepsy, which raged out of control. Uh, Daniel had uh, debilitating uh, problems due to a life of just of manual labor. Oh, okay. And they, their lives sucked. It's just, the long and the short of it is that their <laughs> okay. lives were awful. Okay. And uh and they decided to end them. Oh. So 
they literally they um they made a recording and explained what was going on why they were why they were making the choice that they were making and then they got ready and killed them to kill themselves okay so so mr daniel got a gun and shot her oh, uh, and okay. killed her and then he shot himself in the chest Oh, and that's survived. not the way I would choose to do it. No, Ugh. but he lived. Oh no! Which means that oh no, he is now on the hook for murder. <sighs> so okay, yeah, that's what we got. All right, Apparently, well that sucks. Yeah, he wasn't. He's not insured. He, you know, he didn't have a good health care, so right. he couldn't get the care that he needed. Now, now, to add an interesting twist to this problem, Oregon, as a state, actually has a a law allowing for physician-assisted suicide. Yeah. But it's a very narrow law. So you mm. have to have, I think you have to have a life-threatening disease that's, like, gonna kill you. In it, order to even Life be just can't considered. suck, and you're depressed, and all of that. And you're ready to go. And you're ready to go. And you feel like you've lived long enough. Yeah. Huh. So, I mean, well, that I means the question that's a, is that's a Frank, moral dilemma. It really is a moral dilemma. And the question so that so it brings up a couple questions. The first question is if she wanted him to and she asked him to and he shot her, is he committing murder? Well, in the light, in the eyes of the law, he is. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I, yeah. I don't agree with that. I don't. Personally, I, I, here's the deal: the the law is based in you know the the in the the mores of of the the majority of the people, you know, right? Yeah. And so, like, yeah. most of the people are have sort of this, you know. I mean, I don't know, I don't know, but the, the, if 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 you ask me, and I and I just sort of assess the situation, I say they were making a a, a decision that they were self determining. Their, their, the course right. that their life was going to take. Right. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that at all. No. Um, I, it's your damn life. It's it's your damn life. I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I think that there's a difference also when you're, when you've lived for a while and you make that yeah. choice. I mean, obviously I wouldn't, I would feel a little differently if it was a teenager, you know? Right. Um, yeah. I do feel very different when it's a young person who commits suicide. Um, but this is, yeah, these are older people don't know what who, the fuck they're doing. Yeah, these are older people. They don't have good, I mean, or, or their, their health is failing. Um, they decide together too, you know, and I think that's different. They, they had worked through it together. They'd figured yeah. it out together. And yeah. I kind of, I, I wish that we lived in a society that would be able to respect that, that choice. Yeah. Um, because personally, I don't think there's anything wrong again with, with, with somebody who's sick and a bit older and has decided that, that they're just not, they're not willing to, to go any further, you know, you know what, but they're, they're, the they're in too much pain to, to go on. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I agree with I you. I think there's, there's, and one of the other issues, and I think that this is equally important and this, this, maybe this is what we should be asking ourselves from this story, even greater than the question of, should we allow people to take their own lives which i i agree with you i think people should be if you're you know past a certain age past adolescence you should be it's your life you should be allowed to make that choice for yourself yeah. if you want to but beyond that how shitty are we taking care of our old people <laughs> well it definitely like highlights how, that yeah how bad are we doing what a what a terrible job we're doing as a society that these people and you know you look at the picture of them you can tell that they were having a rough time i think they lived in a in a trailer park and they just didn't have hey, any money my parents like, run a trailer park so i'm not don't, don't down, down on the... trailer parks i'm not dissing on trailer that... parks i'm just saying it it bespeaks a lower income model oh sure yeah yeah and i'm just saying that like we failed these people. If they had had access to good health care, if they had had access to a lot of, uh, you know, to, to, to some of the things that they have, say, in this country, 
that I'm sitting in mm-hmm. where, you know, if I, if I have a problem right now, if I have any problem right now, if my toe breaks, I just call somebody or, or I get in a taxi and not only will I get great care, they'll pay me for the taxi ride. They'll reimburse me. So, like, the fact that we're not taking care of our citizens, I think, is is a shameful, shameful reflection on what our society looks like right now. Yeah. And I'm off the soapbox. Okay. All right. Well, and I would I would also say, though, that, that you know, that there there's there's a thing, there's there's this sort of thread that runs through religion and religious folk with, with their attitudes about life and ending your own mm. life and everything. Uh, of it being yeah. of it being about it's god's choice it's not your choice it's god's choice and i think that right. that's some, this isn't that, your life that we need to like if we can if we can just have that discussion of yeah no you're it's not your life that's interesting you know yeah. it's 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 not your life to 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 do anything with you know and i and, think it's and fine i think that that's you, a very for... different world view and that's that's something that that's that's a really powerful part of 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 a, of an of a non theist life. Yeah, you know, is is well, that I recognition mean, that I I have this is my life, this is my time, and I get to to live it the way that that is going to be best for me. Um, exactly, and of course, I have to live in a society. I have to like obey rules. Um, right, and 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 I can't uh, go. I can't go slashing up other people's bodies and right. tires and whatever. And obviously, but I can like, certainly do that to my thing, to my body. Uh-huh. But obviously, also, you know, I mean, it's not like suicide doesn't have a ripple effect; that it doesn't affect other people. But you're not right. hurting those other people. You're not going out. You're not. You're not stabbing them. You're not punching them. You're not stealing from them. You know, it does seem right. to be rather victimless, uh, even though there will be people who are affected by your loss. There will be people who are sad that you're no longer around, but that doesn't seem to be if enough of are. a reason. That doesn't seem to be enough of a reason. Even if, no. even if there were a hundred people who were dr- just, tr- just traumatized by your death, it doesn't matter. A million people. It's still yours. It's still yours to do with it as you please. Um, right. That's not the kind of harm least... that I think we can, you know, protect people from as a society. Right. So, Honestly, if society is going to allow guys to play bagpipes in the streets, because which we do I, the other day, I was walking, I was walking in, down by Trafalgar Square, and some dude was playing Hava Nagila on the bag, bagpipes. Oh, hey, yeah, there you go. Uh-huh. He's affecting people, <laughs> and I'll tell you something: it's not necessarily a positive effect that he's having on people. Really, but we can't. Pe- but we but we can't regulate. Are you not that. a fan of the the bagpipes, Dan? This is this is a surprising. Actually, fine. This this is a there very was... very. Of all the people I know, <laughs> I I would have guessed that you would have been the person to appreciate that. I I actually really liked. <laughs> yeah, of course he did. Of course he did. But there were there were other people who were probably annoyed. That's all I'm saying. Well, yeah. I'm I'm trying to create a metaphor here. Yeah, I mean the bagpipe is a mildly annoying instrument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> And then, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll come out strong against bagpipes for no reason. Yeah. You never know. Oh, yeah. With for me. sure. For sure. It's hard to tell. Well, anyway. um, speaking of uh, foreign countries, how's yeah. that for a segue? Um, <laughs> South Africa and Denmark um, uh, have both recently made moves to ensure that um, products that enter their country from um, Israeli settlements in the West bank are properly sure. um, labeled as far as like that made in label. Um, because yeah. a lot of these label, these labels have been, have been going out and saying made in Israel. And oh. uh, in, in fact, that's Israeli occupied in- Palestine. Right. Yeah. And so that's just not the case. Yeah. And so um, they, are, are you familiar with a product called soda stream? Dan? <laughs> oh, sure. Who isn't? Well, I, Soda Stream. I that's, think that's you the, are. Uh, you may not know what it's called, but you're, I know you're familiar <laughs> with it. This is okay, make your own soda at home. Oh, oh yeah. Soda Stream. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm... Uh, they're labeled made in Israel. 
one of their large or a lot of them are because their 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 main uh, manufacturing plant is in the West Bank, and they've oh been labeling God, everything really? as made in Israel. And now South Africa and Denmark are have just jumped on board to make sure that they are um, labeled um, made in the occupied Palestinian territory. Wow! Yeah. That's actually a really big deal. That's a huge deal. That's actually like just so just so that everybody's on on the same page here. I I will ex- we should explain that like I mean I guess everybody knows the Palestinian Israeli conflict. They are, they know what's happening. And if you don't look it up. But yeah, but the truth of the matter, you know, I saw a really interesting documentary that took place uh in in Palestinian Palestinian territory. That was a that was about a a an Arab, um, who he was he was he was walking among the. I, I, it was all about the this whole conflict. But these, you got I gotta say, the these these occupiers these these settlements that mm-hmm. that the Israelis are are like just keep pushing further and further into Palestinian territory. Yeah, they're assholes. Yeah, they are just, they are amazing dicks. They will, like, they went and cut down an entire olive orchard once, just to just to make sure that these Palestinian people didn't have a livelihood. Oh no, they, it's they, it's. It, I mean, that's par for the course. They, yeah. Um, I was reading they, recently they about killed. a restaurant that got torn down. I mean, like, like this was like a staple little restaurant. It was family owned. Um, yeah. And it's been torn down like three times now. Um, there's this one specific town, this old village, that's been torn down like thirty some odd times because oh. because they keep going back and they keep rebuilding a little bit, and then they they come in with right. the the tractors and they knock it all down again because they want to do like a national forest or something instead of yeah. having a village there that people have lived in for you know who knows how long centuries so, at least centuries yeah so ridiculous it's uh, oh. it's re- i really you know i i have nothing against <clears throat> israel as a as a country but but the allow them allowing this encroachment with these settlements really disgusts me yeah and when you see the actual what's actually happening on the ground mm-hmm. it's horrifying yeah absolutely oh. horrifying i will not drink soda out of one of those things from a soda stream ever good never good Dan. never again good and I hope they get labeled everywhere. You know, the, there's actually a- the labeling things really cool. Like, what a great, what a what a great way to make a political. It's not not even making a statement. It's like, it's a, what an interesting way to apply political pressure. Oh, yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just saying, really you no. Know, cool. If it came from there, we want people to know about it, and then yeah. they can make their own choice. They can they can sure. then make um, a, a choice as an educated consumer, if if they're if they're even concerned about where things are made. Um, right. But if they are, if they're that kind of person, then they can, they can look. Oh, oh, this was made. Oh, how do I feel about that? You know, right? Oh, but I at really very, want to and, make some Coca Cola at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then you can go ahead. You know what's funny? I just realized that the one person that I know who has a soda stream in their home yeah. is Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean, Dan? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing he's entirely clueless as to the origin of his soda stream f- machine, but oh, he's Jewish. He's Jewish. Wow. Yeah. Do I know this person? Yeah, I think so. Oh, wow. Interesting. Anyway, we'll have to apply some pressure. We'll move. Yes, exactly. We'll we'll, we'll shame him <laughs> later in private. <laughs> in private. <laughs> Uh, so uh here so i i'm gonna get back to uh to a little bit of politics again oh okay please um do. you've heard of this fella obama barack hussein twice. obama oh yeah damn. so why <laughs> why are you bringing up his what? middle name dan it's his middle name I, i'm just i'm just saying what i'm Ew. what's true what are you trying to say with his middle name <laughs> dan I'm I'm using coded language to 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 poison ears against him Hussein. by making him sound all Muslimy and stuff, <laughs> and 
and terrorist. Is, is he does sound ter- more terror? He's like he's probably like eighty five percent more terroristy when you include his middle name. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, so he's been in trouble lately. You, so you remember the whole Sibelius story that I was telling you about? Mm-hmm. Because so the Catholic Church has been so pissy with them, so pissy about about <laughs> all the, about this whole mandate thing and all this stuff uh-huh. that uh, that he President Obama has been has, has decided to hire a guy uh, a faith outreach director. Uh-huh. Oh, for this campaign. Eh, okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah. So, it is basically it's basically just according to an inside an inside source who refused to speak on the record. Uh-huh. It's basically because of persistent uh, opposition from Catholic groups. That is the main reason. Oh, it should just be his Catholic outreach coordinator then. I know. Well, ironically, he's not the guy that he tapped to do it. Michael Ware. Mm-hmm. It was raised Catholic, but now attends a non-denominational evangelical style church. Oh, that's probably yeah. Okay, he he knows the two main groups that he really needs to hit. Yeah, but if you're trying to if you're trying to get the Catholics on board with you, doesn't that piss him off? <laughs> you get somebody who used to be Catholic and then gave him the big old fu. <laughs> eh, he's not going to be the one out doing the outreach. I mean, this this one man is not going to be going to every single Catholic in the country, you know. I'll, I'll bet he sits down with a bishop or two. Probably, yeah. That might. It's hard to do, by the way. Sitting down with a bishop is not necessarily easy. Well, their robes get in the for, way. Well, it was. I'm just. I'm trying to tease for later. No, I, I heard you, but I was trying to make a joke. <laughs> okay, so so okay, go ahead, Frank. Make your robe comment again. I'll laugh. I promise. Shut up, God. <laughs> okay, so Dan, it's hard for priests to sit down, right? Because they wear robes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, now there's a our president has a Catholic has a faith vote coordinator, faith vote coordinator. How does that sound? Yeah. Go. Yeah. Maybe, oh. maybe he'll start to sound more and more Republican. Ew. Yeah, probably not. Well, speaking of faith, how about you? Yeah. Non-faith, non-believers. Oh, I hate those guys. Uh, apparently, we're uh, we're flexing our political muscles. Oh, I know I am. Yeah, I've been working out. Your your political muscles. You've been working out your political. I've been muscles working thing? my political muscles. You know, when you go to the gym. And you get on the the machine that's the political muscle machine. Uh huh. I've been I've been working that thing. Yeah, yeah. You're you're looking politically ripped, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, anyways, Let's try. Um, one of the um apparently uh one of the biggest areas for um growth in political activism um well concerning religion has been yeah. uh, from the non-religious. Oh. Interesting, right? Yeah. Um, there's a new group. It's called the Secular Coalition for America. Um, yeah. Well, actually, it's not. I'm sorry. It's not a new group. I totally, totally. They have a new philo- They have a new strategy. They have a, a new approach Ooh, that they're taking. Strategy. Um, they, um, they're actually going to go local. They they've decided to install directors in 18 states to uh, take the message to you know to to the local governments to school boards to city halls to yeah. maybe some state legislate legislators um, and they are um, trying to uh, to mobilize oh and they're also going to be trying to mobilize local um, atheists agnostics secu- human seculars mm. whatever. Um, on on, How about on this? behalf you ready? of huh, I got a thing. You ready? Okay. Frank and Dan, lobbyists. <laughs> we should we you, should we should be their be outreach guys for Utah. You want to lobby? I don't want to lobby. Yeah, I don't want to lobby. You don't? No, no. They probably wouldn't <laughs> let us have a podcast either, Dan. Not this podcast. Oh, uh, we could probably podcast. Well, we can't, we, but it would be a very different podcast, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, anyways, um. Yeah, so it's 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 really interesting because what what they've what they've done is they've realized um, that 
most of the policy that actually affects us as as atheists and non-believers in general um, typically takes place in the, on, on the local level. It's usually a, a, a dipshit school board, right? <laughs> um, that, right. That makes some weird, you know, decision or, 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 or whatever, some idiot legislator that, you know, whatever it's this, the, the bad stuff doesn't come from Congress, um, as on, right. on sort of the, in, in this realm, <laughs> because plenty of bad That's comes true. from Congress, let's face it. Um, but what, what's interesting is that, um, there's um, sort of this, you know, the, the the article goes on and it's like, oh, you know, this is amazing and blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, it takes that little turn for the worse at the end. Um, that, and it's like, oh, some progress may be a long time coming, said Ellen Johnson, executive director of Enlighten the Vote and former president of American Atheists. It is hard to get atheists to agree on anything but their atheism, she said. We are mostly, <laughs> we are mostly liberals, I'll grant you that. But once you veer off into anything besides church and state separation issues, most, a- most atheists will argue. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I mean, again, this is the whole thing of atheism is not a belief system. Right. It's, but, not, it's not anything, you know, it's not any one thing. But it's a lack of one here, thing. Here's the deal. That's all. This, this attitude, though, of like, oh, that's going to take a long time because we just can't agree on anything. It's <laughs> it, it kind of actually reminded me of the sort of the state of the um, gay rights movement um, um. pre 1960s when uh, when everybody when all the lesbian groups and all the gay groups decided you know what we ha- we because they historically didn't like each other <laughs> the lesbians right. didn't like the gay men and vice versa <laughs> and and because they had very You're- different very different, you know, communities and agendas and yeah. things that they wanted, do, do, blah, blah, blah. Do you want to hear they what... they just weren't going to get in the same my, room. And they do you want to hear gonna... what one of, my, one of my gay friends had to say? When, this, is, this is about five or seven years ago or something. And he just... He, he found out that one of our other mutual friends was coming out of the closet as a lesbian. And he admitted that he had kind of avoided lesbians in his life. And I said, why? And he said... Well, I just look at them and I think, what are you wearing? <laughs> God. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, no, but it, it was it was in the moments when, I mean, the, there were obviously a lot of historical things that were taking place that really, you know, all happened at the same time. But one of the big things right. was they kind of put their differences aside and said, you know what, there, there's these few, there's these couple common issues that we do have in common. Right. There's, right. there's these, these, these couple issues that, that, that do tie us together. And if we just focus on that, we can go be our big lezzy selves and we can go be our big, you know, homo selves over here, gay selves over here. And, you know, we'll be fine. We and, can still have our own bars, we can still, da, 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 but we can, as a group, join forces. And because let's face it, it's a group that represents what? maybe 10% of the population, depending on some, I mean, but right. out and active and all that. I mean, it's even a smaller percentage of the population. Non-believers, right. we're a bigger portion. We're a bigger part That's than that. true. And if we would just That's like true. set aside our, 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 some of our, our silly differences, okay, you want to go out and be stupid, you know, zombie Muhammad, you go girl, <laughs> right? You go do yeah, that. Sure. Absolutely. You know, um, but what we really need to do is we really need to tie together, focus on on just these church state separation issues that we can universally right. agree on. Um, and you know what? We can find common cause with a whole bunch of other people on a lot of these things. You know, we've got the an entire scientific community, which even if they're believers, they're going to want there to be they're 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 going to be you know against creationism in schools. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's true. We can find common cause with a whole lot of groups, right? If we if we work together well, right? And and reaching out so, is is obviously you know important part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, but in this article, they had some really interesting things. I did not realize. Did you know that there's already an atheist member of Congress? What? Pete Stark, a Democrat from California, representative, House of Representatives. Of course, it's California. Of course, it is. Um, but there's Cecil Bothwell, a uh, Democratic candidate for North Carolina's 11th congressional district, is running as North open, Carolina. Uh huh. Open atheist. Uh, is he even right allowed now. to run for anything? I don't know. 
I um, actually think they do have a law on the books in, in one of the Carolinas that says, that, I mean, it's not constitutional, so it's not enforced, but there is a law that says you can't run for office if you are if you don't believe in God. Hmm. Hmm. That's bizarre. Anyway. Uh, the National yeah. Atheist Party, established in March 2011, has okay. members in all 50 states, Dan. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm not going to join that. Okay. That party. What? Well, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not going to be in any party. I'm a I'm an independent. Oh, Dan. <laughs> but but I will I will appreciate their lobby lobbying efforts. Uh-huh. Oh, good. Good. And support them. Good. You yeah. you 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 go. You go, girl. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> girl. <laughs> All right, Dan, let's uh let's take a quick break. Um, yeah. But before we do, um, if you'd like to, you know, add your voice, join your voice to our conversation, uh, you can check us out on Facebook dot com slash TGI Atheist or follow our Twitter feed yeah. at TGI Atheist dot. Or, no, there's no dot there. <laughs> Just Twitter <laughs> at TGI Atheist. I was getting carried away. Or you can you can email us. You can write us at podcast at thank God I'm Atheist dot com. And you'll notice that that's a domain. Thank God I'm Atheist dot com. Check out our website. Yeah, go on there. Have some fun. Yeah, or leave us a voicemail, 424-666-8442. Going to take a quick break. Uh, should we set this up? So wh- what you're about to hear is <clears throat> is a a sermon at the wedding of, I mean, I know we all watched it, but the mm, wedding of, of, of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think we all watched it. I was were glued, glued to my set. <laughs> but we'll just listen to a little bit of that service. All right. And then we'll explain why. Be who God meant you to be, and you will set the world on fire. So said St. Catherine of Siena, whose festival day it is today. Marriage is intended to be a way in which man and woman help each other to become what God meant each one to be, their deepest and their truest selves. Many people are fearful of the prospects for our world, but the message of the celebrations in this country and far beyond its shores is the right one. This is a joyful day. It is good that people in every continent are able to share in these celebrations because this is, as every wedding day should be, a day of hope. In a sense, every wedding is a royal wedding, with the bride and the groom as king and queen of creation, making a new life together so that life can flow through them into the future. William and Catherine, you have chosen to be married in the sight of a generous God who so loved the world that he gave himself to us. That's nice, Dan. Oh, that is nice. <laughs> That's just a <laughs> marriage. Marriage is what brings us mm. yeah. together <laughs> today. <laughs> um, so, wow. that, that was the Bishop of London. Ooh. The Bishop of London Bishop. is the uh what? Bishop Robert? Bishop Bishop Richard. Bishop Oh. Why does you oh when you emailed me the link oh, did you I, put Bishop uh, Robert. I typed Robert. So it's okay. Reverend well, Richard. Richard Chatra. <laughs> the 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 right reverend and right honorable Richard John Carew Chatra. Mm. <laughs> wow. He's uh I so like yeah, he's the third in seniority in the Church of England after the Archbishops of Canterbury and York. Ooh. And, yeah. Wow. And and the ordinary of the Church of England Diocese of London. He's ordinary? So, I I I guess so. I have no idea what that phrase means. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. But yeah, he's uh and he's got that great that great voice, that yeah. Great, uh, they have a they have a, it's like a cadence, don't they? That is, it's, they do. Mm, um, mm, it just kind of, but, kind of lulls you his, along. His, his is kind of 
Christopher Lee esque in timbre. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sure. Is yeah. it, he's got a very. It, he's got a great. I, I, so the reason we're playing him okay. is because today I went to the St. Paul's Church, St. Paul's Cathedral, which is the big cathedral, that, that sort of a, a classical style cathedral in the middle of London, in, in actual London. There's like, for those of you who don't know London uh, geography... London is actually London itself. London proper is a one mile square. It's not big, right? It's tiny, and uh, and St Paul's Church is sort of one of the the main things in it. It's it's a very important church. It was, it's and it's gorgeous. By the way, it was it was it was designed by Christopher Wren back right after the uh, the fire Ooh. of London. Oh, the Great Fire. Okay, back in uh, oh, whenever that was. I don't remember when that was. Anyway, um, so yeah, I went there, and it's Pentecost today. I don't know if you knew that. Happy Pentecost, Frank. Fire. What? <laughs> You're going back to fire? Pentecost. Is that fiery? I think so. Well, mm. well, the way the way the bishop described it in his sermon today, it's it's the it's the celebration, the festival, no less, of when. Um, when God gave the uh, Holy Spirit to us, mm, yeah, to us, rain down mortals. like fire, right? Oh, okay, sure. So- fire. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. anyway, so so there we are at. So there I am at St. Paul's. Um, there because I'm too cheap to actually pay to go into a church. So you go on Sunday and then you get and you listen to the service and then you get to see the place for free. They charge you on the other days. Oh yeah! No way! Yeah, and it's hefty too. It's like fourteen pounds or something crazy what? like that. Yeah. Well, I think you get to go up, up to the the top spire. Who so it's cares? Like, I'm not well, going to pay to go view. into a church. Yeah. Okay. So, so you chose anyway, so, so wisely. Yes, indeed. I went to this to the service. I'm I'm not going to do a full church review because it's just like any Catholic service, except that it was a sung Eucharist, which which is nice. They they actually sang the lovely choir. Okay. And they uh, and and God, the grandeur of this place. I can't overstate how grand this place is, um, including making it impossible for the congregants to actually sing a hymn together because there's so oh. much echoing that when that when the organ plays like. People on one side hear it years before people on the other side hear it. And it's just like everything's <laughs> echoing around and you can't like everybody's trying to sing along with each other and nobody can get anything right. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, so this this but the but because it's Pentecost, the bishop presided over this service, which wow. is rare. OK, you don't you usually you usually get the, the Some local flunky. priest or whatever. Okay. Yeah. So after the service, I sat there and I listened to the organist play a nice Bach piece. Oh, that's and then nice. uh, and then as I, it was really nice actually. Yeah. And you know, and and plus I knew that once the service was over, if I started, if I kept hanging out and looking around, then they would be all, then they would try to make me pay. So I just sat there listening and looking around, looking up at the ceiling, at the, I mean the place is just outstanding. Anyway. So as I'm walking out, out pops the bishop. No. And I went over and I congratulated him for uh for a lovely serv- service. No way. And his sermon was his sermon was actually really nice. I I liked his sermon. He talked a little bit. He mentioned the uh the horribleness that happened in um Syria recently. Okay. And stuff and he, it was just it was just a really really nice uh service as they go. So I said, "Hey, Thanks for that. And he asked me where I was from, and I told him, and he asked me if Mitt Romney was from Utah. <laughs> I was like, no, but he is a Mormon. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we discussed that a little bit. And then and then, I just, I, I sacked up and I said, hey, uh, I'm in town for X amount of time. Do you want, would, would you let me interview you? Wow. And he said, yeah. I told him I did a podcast. And... The funny thing is, I said I I do a podcast that that does that's focuses on religion related themes, and then I was like, <laughs> oh crap, I don't want to I don't want to mislead the guy. <laughs> yeah. So then I so, so then after he agreed, I was like, by the way, I should tell you, uh, just 
it's the the podcast is an atheist podcast and stuff and he uh-huh. was yeah. he was fine with that he was actually so completely gracious about wow. everything that's cool okay so so he agreed so he he told me and and i you know i was i thought you know i'm here for three weeks let's find a time and he was like well if you can be at saint mary mary what, what is it oh I, now i've totally spaced what the church was Mary, before, Mary Alder, Al, Alder Mary, St. Mary, Alder Mary. There you go. Church. Okay. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I thought uh, that was funny. <laughs> it's a weird name. He had to say it to <laughs> me like three times and then, and then spell it. Oh. He said, I'll be there at three 45 and we can, we can do an interview. Well, it turns out that he was conducting a sermon at a, at that church wow. at four. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. So, so I had a little bit of time. 15 minutes. Yeah. Essentially. I I had 10 minutes essentially. Right. To uh to interview him. Uh for which That's I was great, though. completely unprepared. So, but I got an interview. Yeah, that's awesome. I, that's super. I awesome. That's a pretty good get right there. Yeah, that's great. So I I went in and um unfortunately, I didn't have time to even set up like my microphone and my, you know, my recording equipment so that it would sound good. I just had time to rush in and pull out my iPhone. Uh-huh. And and do a voice memo. Okay, right. <laughs> and so yeah. so I recorded him on the iPhone. Um, so we'll play that now for you. Okay. Uh, just in case in case you're confused, everybody, uh, between whose voice is whom, <laughs> mine is the one that sounds like a complete idiot. Oh no! Stammering and like like completely flustered, and his is the one. That sounds like an elder statesman of the universe, like mm. God himself, so comported, so lovely, oh, yeah. <laughs> with a British... Next time I interview a Brit, you need to remind me of this, Frank. First of all, I'm not a great inter- interviewer. As we learned l- when I interviewed <laughs> Jim Ta- Professor Tabry right. a while back, I'm not a great interviewer. Well, let's work I admit on that. this. Yeah, we should. Okay. We should work on that. Because you know what? But the other thing is... But the other thing is that uh, he, the next time I interview a Brit, I'm I'm doing a British accent just so that I don't sound like a crass American compared <laughs> by comparison. Because it's no, that's not. Oh, it. <laughs> You're like okay. Anyway, okay. Just so you know, apologize. I am going to conduct this interview. Once I start, it's going to be with a Brit with a British accent. Like yeah. they would think you, you're an I idiot. Just can't. Of course they would. But trust me, I sound like enough of an idiot anyway. So okay. it wouldn't make it wouldn't have made me any more idiotic. All right. But let, let's, take, let's he, take But what he has to say is lovely. So okay. here it is. Here we go. So uh, I guess first of all, I I don't know what to call you. I know that you're the Bishop of London. Yes. Bishop Richard. And uh, Bishop Bishop Richard is what you prefer to be called? Yes. Okay. Um, for Utah, because uh, <laughs> my actual title is unusable, really, in Utah. <laughs> Which is what? My Lord Bishop. Ah. Indeed. So, I guess since I have so little time with you, and I and I'd like to avoid staying st- as surface as we can, I, I guess my my question for you is, and this is this would be what would most be on the minds of of my listeners. What's important about how you liaise with the non-believing part of 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 society, and 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 where do you feel the intersections are? are between the, the believers and the non-believers now? I think that's a very important question. Here, of course, um, the situation in England is that the Church of England is not really a membership organization. We're not interested only in our gang and getting recruits to our gang. The classical idea is that if you're vicar of a parish, you're the vicar for everybody who lives there. I myself opened a mosque, of course, when I was uh, bishop in the East End in the poorest part of London because um, the Muslims thought that, well, I I was their bishop, really, and uh, on their side. So I hope that uh, that which is in our DNA is uh, our fundamental attitude. We are interested, obviously, um, in a society that is united in uh, pursuing the spiritual evolution of human beings. And uh, 
there is a vast range of causes and uh, responsibilities with which um, we can share uh, an interest and common cause with uh, any number of citizens. So that's where we start with, with our unity there. And I think that um, especially with people in this very cosmopolitan city, because uh, London must be among the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, uh, relations with people of other faiths and people of goodwill, that uh, is a very major part of the job. And I have myself established um, a centre in a church that was blown up by a terrorist bomb in Bishopsgate here in the city of London, St. Ethelberger's Church, which is explicitly uh, related to the search for reconciliation and peace and uh, is seen as a home for people of all faiths and people of goodwill who have no faith. The church seems to be losing uh, traditional parishioners. Do, do you mourn that? Well, I'm not a salesman for God, you see. Um, I think that... Um, Religion is exposed to many, many dangers. And, of course, this is uh, obviously true from the history of all religious traditions, that what is so easy is for us to invent a god, to make a god in our own image, to project various unacknowledged parts of ourselves, at best our best thoughts and at worst some of the shadow side, some of the anger, to project that into the middle distance, to call that God and engage with, with that uh, projection of ourselves. And that's what all the prophets call idolatry, and it is extremely dangerous. And so one must be very alert to that and very alert to um, a sense that it all depends on my management and my salesmanship, um, uh, or I'll, otherwise the cause will go down. Uh, there are some very good reasons why people don't believe in the God who underwrote absolutist regimes in whose name the will of the one extinguished the will of the many. There are very good reasons why uh, that God uh, has become increasingly incredible in Europe. But I would say that in this country um, there is um, a... Um, turn of the tide, um, we were perhaps as a church too much at home in Churchill's Britain. We were disoriented by the vast social revolution of the 1960s, but in this diocese the church is growing, and I think it's growing in a very healthy way. Um, I, of course, go around like uh, one of our politicians uh, of yesteryear, very famously said, I go around stirring up apathy wherever I can, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going around battering people over the head, but I'm just overwhelmed at the moment by the number of doors that stand open, the real perturbation uh, in a society which only the day before yesterday, 20 years ago, we sit here in 2012, and I remember 1992 because I was consecrated bishop in the poorest part of London in 1992, and almost at the same time, Francis Fukuyama, whom you'll remember, um, and I'm glad to say who still lives and dines a prosperous gentleman, he published a book um, suggesting that we were within sight, really, of building heaven on earth, without God, of course, but with the assistance of liberal democracy and market economics. And he wrote his great book, The End of History. Well, I think 20 years later, that looks less and less plausible. <laughs> history moves on. And uh, I think after a period when people began to quit um, a religious practice that uh, was underwritten by social approval um, and perhaps to lose faith in a God, it's uh, really good to lose faith in, the God who underwrites absolutism and the will of the one against the will of the many. We are now in a situation where I think incumbency is very much... Um, very much belongs to the uh, Anglo-American elite who believed until comparatively recently that the story of God would only have one end. Mm. He would be sent to the margins, to the leisure sector, to be the harmless hobby, although, of course, I realize that in American context it isn't always so harmless, the harmless hobby of those who have antiquarian interests. 
That's not how it looks now, because I think um, as the tectonic plate shift, as the prestige of Western ideas is challenged um, by the enormous uh, crisis through which we are passing and from which we have not yet emerged, I think that people's minds are open to other realities now in a way perhaps they haven't been for most of my ordained life. So I see this as a time of um, great, uh, well, from my point of view, um, great and dangerous opportunity because this century, and uh, I want really to think London, think Christian, rather than thinking my denomination and think the world, think spiritual, I think this is a century of enormous promise but enormous peril. Uh, and uh, they are well balanced. Uh, there are extraordinary forces at work that could tear our world to pieces. And so I simply look around for allies in a common struggle. And I find those allies very frequently among spiritually alert people who couldn't possibly subscribe to the faith um, which I represent and in which I believe. I'm going to ask you one more question, and it's, it's almost scary to ask this. What, what if there is no God? For you, what if there is no God? Well, all I can say is that um, it would um, falsify um, the energy that I experience. It would uh, falsify... The, the glory, the beauty. And so I simply cannot imagine that in this world of such beauty and promise as well as such uh, frustration and such pain, uh, I cannot imagine a situation in which um, God was not real. That, of course, is not to say that um, I um, am in a position to... Um, second guess the thoughts of God, still less to set myself up in the place of God. And I'll end with something which has always resonated with me, which is something the poet Rilke said. Rilke said about God this, you have such a quiet manner of existence that those who name you with a loud insistence show they've forgotten your proximity. Bishop, thank you so much. Great to see you, Dan. Great to see you. And um, happy travels. And, thank uh, you. Safe journey back to Utah. Wow, he's he's a delight. Isn't he? Yeah. Well, that that, that had to be a thrill, Dan. It was, uh, it was nerve-wracking. I was nervous. <laughs> I'll be honest. It was, uh, That's but a... it was a thrill. And he was so gracious. Just, I can't tell you how, how gracious he was. If you want to... And, by the way, mm-hmm. I will post pictures on the Facebook page um, of me with him. Oh, really? Yeah, please do. Yes. Yeah. Photo, uh, fo- photos that were taken on my iPhone by a, a man who the bishop introduced to me as vicar of, of, what was it? Vicar of a church that has one of the most incredible names of all the churches or something like that. And apparently it was it was something like... Uh, the Church of St. Andrew in the wardrobe or something like that. <laughs> and I, re- I I had to bite my tongue because all I really wanted to say was, is that the same as in the closet? Oh, um, <laughs> they were probably thought that was funny. Probably not. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> probably not. I don't know. No, actually, you know what? Mm-hmm. After this, the second service of theirs that I of his that I saw, mm-hmm. which was the service immediately following this... Uh, this interview which i stayed for oh cool it was it was a much more like hippie sort of service not in saint paul's but at this saint mary's right of mary of mary what did i call it i don't remember <laughs> anyway so at this other church and it was very it was mary very, alder like, mary alder mary yeah. thank you yeah and it, the the service was all about like there were there were prayers that included you know you know in these troubled times of and I couldn't really hear a lot of it because there were kids sitting in front of me that were screaming and whatever sure. but something about in the times of you know <clears throat> with homosexuality and with with gender identity and 
clearly this was a congregation based on accepting everybody. Okay. And it was a really, it was very, very uh, open and loving and hippy dippy and stuff. Oh, cool. And and the bishop and the bishop seemed equally comfortable with that congregation as he did with the giant uh, cathedral group. Right. Huh. So there you go. It's a, it, just a great guy. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like, you know, like I, he's 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 so eloquent, and he, and and I and I really appreciate sort of the the more you know when, when he says things like you know that because because I've always I've always considered sort of that idea of like because the Mormons do the same thing right of a bishop is the bishop for everyone in the in a mm. in an area um, and so right. they're doing the same thing with their vicars and I've always thought it just incredibly presumptuous. Right, but yeah, me too. It's always it's always rubbed me a little weird. But he 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 talks about it in a, in kind of a really nice way, you know, in sort of this more ecumenical, you know, um, universal um, way where it's like, oh well, he's he's ju- he is for whatever reason and whatever he f- sees as his own authority, he is interested in the spiritual development of of all the people. In, in a specific area. And right. while I'm like, well, spiritual development, wah, 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 you know, I don't know if that's really what I'm looking for. I, I think that that does go back to sort of that idea of some of the things that we've been talking about of, of like, you know, religion has figured out ways to speak about parts of the human existence, i.e. the soul, right? Right. It's given name right. to something that, uh, a secular understanding of, of the world has a hard time putting a name to. Sure. Sure. Um, but I mean, I think and, we have to acknowledge that it's there, that there's a, that there's, I mean, well, you, if you don't want to call it spirit. Yeah. And soul obviously is something... a little, a little loaded as well, you know, but right. like, but like there, there's, there's a, there, I feel myself lifted up and, and in, 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 in sort in, in sort of when appreciating the, 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 the immense beauty of a thing, right? Right. Um, and, I, and I feel myself pushed into um, a, a realm, not a realm, but a, a state of mind that, it, that, that that's different than my normal state of mind. Yeah. And so, so anyway, so but he talks to that, and I think he, he, he does a wonderful job of, 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 of speaking about that in a way that I didn't find <laughs> horribly offensive. Um, right, exactly. But, but then he 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 does bring up something that I think is really interesting when he's talking about how he cannot conceive a world where there a world that is so beautiful without there being a god, right? Right. And I and I just I step back and I I just I can't conceive of a world that is as disjointed and is as a mess and is as beautiful as our world, right. and there there being something supernatural behind it right i i can't conceive of a of a supreme being that would have or a creator that would have created this exactly you know it's funny had i more time with him if i if i had been with him for you know half an hour 45 minutes an hour or something like that i think i would have called him on that yeah i think i would have asked him about that yeah but you know i didn't have any time and and i i figured you know what he He's he's made he's this is where he's come to and he was so gracious to to even just answer the sure. question. I mean, uh, so, uh, but th- I mean that's a good question. You, you know, yeah. But that 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 was a really good question. Um, so to pose to somebody in that position. So yeah, well done, Dan. Cool. Um. All right. Well, if you'd like to um, join our conversation, of course, we have a few ways you can do that. Yeah. You know what? Start, start, this time start with the, the, the voicemail. Okay. Leave us a voicemail, 424-666-8442. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's TGIA at the end there. If you want to, <laughs> if you don't want to remember n- okay. numbers. Or you can email us at podcast at thankgodimatheist.com. And of course you can follow us on our Facebook, facebook.com slash Atheist or our Twitter feed at Atheist. Thanks for listening, guys. Have a good one.